From Boca Raton, Florida, Rabbis Ephraim Goldberg, Philip Moskowitz, and Josh Brody are taking you Behind the Bema. The BRS rabbis schmooze about contemporary issues and talk to special guests who give a behind the scenes look at how they got to where they are and what keeps them going. Welcome to Behind the Bema. Good evening. It is Wednesday evening. I'm Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg with a special edition of Behind the Bema. I had the incredible privilege of being in Israel recently and sitting down with Rav Yitzchak Berkowitz. Rav Berkowitz is an extraordinary individual. And, you know, it's very much on our minds right now, this spike, this rise of anti-Semitism, not only around the world and not only even in the United States of America, which for a long time we were lulled into the false belief that we were protected and immune We've seen people be beaten in the streets. We've seen famous people, and most recently, Kyrie Irving, NBA stars, rappers, who are unabashedly and with no shame promoting, tweeting, defending, doubling down on anti-Semitic statements and rhetoric. And it's against that backdrop that we have to continue to raise our voice and confront and battle it, but also how refreshing it is to have conversations like the one I was privileged to have with Rev Berkowitz, a, a beacon of light and a call and a charge to improve the world with a message of hope, a message of light, a message of blessing, the Jewish responsibility to transform the world for the good. And as much as we have to focus on what's going wrong in the sense of the anti-Semitism, we have to focus on what could be going right, caring about our brothers and sisters around the world and feeling that responsibility for outreach. And in many ways, that is our response, to be that bright light and to become a people and live such a lifestyle that others are just attracted and drawn who will dismiss and who will stand up and confront those voices of, of anti-Semitism. Roberkowitz is uh, American-born, enormous Tamachacham. He's a huge posek. He's a big halachic decisor for the Anglo-Jewish community in Israel and around the world. He uh, spent 16 years as the mashkiach of Eish Torah before he left to start his own kolal in 2001. He founded the Jerusalem Kolal, which is an um, intense kolal experience, but an eye towards preparing the graduates who will go out and be involved in Kirov and outreach around the world. 2019, he was appointed as the Rosh Hashiva of Yeshiva's Eish HaTorah in Yerushalayim. He's also the Rosh Kolal of an international network of evening kololim and an expert in Ben Adam Lachavero, the relationship, the laws that govern and that regulate our interpersonal relationships between one and the other. He, you'll, you'll see his Simcha Sachaim, his joy for life, what a special person he is. And I was really excited and privileged to be able to have the opportunity for this conversation and the special edition of Behind the Bima. So without any further, please enjoy the great Harav Yitzchak Berkowitz Shlita. It's a tremendous chus to be with the Rosh Hashiva, to have the opportunity to have this conversation and share it with the world and to be able to drink from the fountain and learn from the wisdom of the Rosh Hashiva. I have tremendous uh, affection and gratitude to Isha Torah. When I was in Yeshiva, there was a Kira training program that came to Kerbi Avatar Yeshiva. I spent the summer as a Madrich on Discovery. And even today, Ish uh, very graciously continues to print my articles on the website. So I have tremendous uh, connection and, and uh, closeness and very, very grateful to Rashid this time. It's great having you here. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, and it's also great having you on Ish.com. Thank you. Thank you. So I have to answer this backdrop. We're sitting overlooking Harabayas, overlooking the Kotel, in this incredibly sacred spot. What an incredible time that we live in, what a brach it is to be. I know the Rashid's parents were Holocaust survivors. And does the Rosh Hashiva ever sitting in this office, looking over this view, thinking about where the Rosh Hashiva lives and, and the yeshiva, just to pinch ourselves in the context of Jewish history with what the Rosh Hashiva's parents endured, lived through, and survived, and now in contrast to be sitting in Yerushalayim, overlooking our bias, sitting and learning Torah, spreading the message around the world, it must be overwhelming. It is overwhelming. I, I never take it for granted. Uh, I come in every morning. First, I look to see if the mosque is still there. No, but I come in every morning and just with this feeling of where I am. Um, I ask myself, would I believe that I'd be here someday? And the truth is, my answer is yes. Yes, yes, yes. We grew up dreaming. We grew up dreaming. Um, but it's also the place of a corporate. It's the place of a corporate. And that, that, also, uh, that, that also has to move on. And we understand that the corporate, although it is more pronounced here than anywhere else, but what the Churban is really all about is our brethren everywhere. And yes, every morning I walk in, I feel the Churban. Feel the Churban. Feel where is Khan's, where is Khan 
this job. And I'm always beautiful here. The office is beautiful. The building is beautiful. Both buildings are beautiful. Uh, you know, the Coco Plaza is beautiful. Um, although it's beautiful, it's so depressing. You know what's supposed to be. You know what comes from this supposed to be. And that's that other side of the coin, that maybe we don't feel often enough. We see the beauty and, and coming in today, we heard the music, maybe there's a simcha being celebrated in the restaurants and there's such a feeling of vibrancy in life, but, but the main thing is missing. And the main thing that's not there, which, which leads me to the next question. So, the summer I spent here and I met with, with Rav Weinberg, with Rosh Hashid at the time, and he imposed on me and like all others, the spiritual holocaust happening at a rate faster than Hitler and our enemies ever could have dreamt. I was, uh, I was a uh, young yeshiva bachar, I didn't want to go to the places they were sending to go do recruiting for, for discovery program at the time. And he called me in and he asked me, would, if a woman were extending her hand to save her from the train to Auschwitz, would you not pull her off? Klai Yisrael needs you to go out. And, and the intermarriage rate, I don't have to tell her, yeshiva, where we live in Boca Raton, Florida, is 140,000 Jews. Palm Beach County has a quarter of a million Jews, 92% of whom are unaffiliated. The Bichlal not connected, not involved. The demographic study, you were affiliated if you work out at a JCC. And Becholso, still with that, 92% are unaffiliated. That's the level of assimilation, of intermarriage. That's what's going on around us. So, I, I don't believe this. I'm asking a question that I, I don't believe, but I want to hear this formulation. I think it's important for us. Why not double down on the Shomri Torah Mitzvot, the Orthodox, the observant Torah community, and write off right off the era of Rav. Why not say that this is our generation's, this is a tragedy, it's a loss, it's overwhelming, but we're not making headway, we're not moving the needle, we're not stemming the tide, so instead let's put our resources, let's put our money, our manpower, our wisdom, our time, but dedicate it all to ensuring in the observant community we keep everybody in. Why care about outreach? Why be involved in Kirov? Why be connected or feel responsible for the fate of the rest of the Jewish people, which feels in many ways like a sinking ship? How many brothers are you willing to give up on? These are, these are brothers or sisters. Are you ready to give up on them? They're going to be lost because of our inadequacy. Because we haven't figured it out yet. Because we haven't learned how to reach them. I've seen, I've seen this a lot. There were certain Rashi Yeshiva that will tell them to come here, just sit and learn, and that'll be my shi in the world in a way that it's going to change everybody. And of course, I mean, if you don't believe that, you're not the girls. Of course, that's true. Nevertheless, nevertheless, when Chas Vishal, there's someone in their family, a kid that's struggling, or a kid that's past struggling, we get the phone call. you got to take them in. But it's not suitable for our program. But you have to take him in. You have to save him. Ah. So he's your family and everybody else is not. That, that I don't understand. Then we're calling you slow. These are the brothers. And then we give up. Why? It's their fault. They did something wrong. We, we're fortunate. We're fortunate. So because of that, we just forget about that. We, we gotta try. You know, if not, if not for the Noah, there would never been, we never, never been thousands of families that became full then. So now it's more difficult, it's different. It was no different then. Just it was somebody who thought creatively. And now, what he taught us doesn't work in, in those ways. We've gotta find new ways of reaching people. And, and we do. It's not like nothing's working, it's just the numbers are us. And we have to find ways of reaching so many more people. But when I really give up, I didn't give up with brothers. So how do we allocate our resources and our time? How much should we invest in, in that? Because it's not up to professionals alone, and I know that's a big age program, Project Inspire, but if we rely only on Rabbanim, Machanachem, Chai Kodesh, and Kirov professionals, we'll never move that needle. So for the average person out there who is focused on getting to the end of the day, paying the yeshiva tuition, the cost of kosher food, trying to be a Ben Ali or a Ben Torah in a world where there's a lot of forces against and it's just trying to get to an end of the day where they worked and earned a living, learned a little Torah, made it to Minyan, were a good 
mother, father, husband, wife, how much time should they be giving? How focused should they be? How do they divide their life to care about what's happening outside them? It's so terrible to have Shabbos guests. It's so terrible to invite a business associate who isn't flowing for Shabbos. It's such a terrible thing. It's too big a sacrifice. So I know people say, who am I? I'm not a car. My Shabbos table isn't going to do it. Any Shabbos table can do it. We take so much of what we do for granted. But just the Shabbos, we don't have to give big sermons. A Shabbos table, a family sitting together, sitting as near as a family sitting together, having at least part of the, part of the conversation is indelible. Certainly not what the conversation at their home sounds like. Where little kids are involved, the kid comes over with a parasha sheet. You know what that, you know what, that, what that does? The things we take for granted, our Shabbos table is, is a world they've never seen. He fed them, he fed these people. Well, it's like you don't know anybody not fool. It doesn't, it doesn't mean investing so much of your time. And by the way, the best way to get people to do it is to get them to do it. One good experience, and they're going to want more and more. We find that all the time. You can even douche into people from morning to night about the importance of security. Just get them, one way or another, get them to try it once. They see how they can affect another person's life. They see how, I didn't even do anything, he was so excited. And if someone gets pushed back and says, you know, I'm trying to raise my children a certain way, I'm trying to maintain a certain insular at home, there are a lot of forces out there, secular culture and, and progressiveness, and I, I don't want that, my kid's exposed. So what would the Rosh Hashim say to such a person who says, we're trying to create something insular, we don't need it penetrated by outside forces. Those days are over. The world has gotten too small. It infiltrates everywhere. The kids are exposed to everything. Let's not kid ourselves. In the Harvard, they used to say, why is it the Chodos of Chodos goes through all the different stakes you can have in the moon, all the different happy courses he presents us with? Well, why does he have to tell us that? So they used to say, better than you hear it from the Chodos of Chodos than somewhere else. And it's the same thing here. It's within the context of home of people who are trying to understand things about Yiddishkeit. It's in your home, on your turf, and you're explaining things to them. It's going to do so much better for your kids than they're getting it else. In the Rosh Hashira's own life, is Rosh Hashira had to sacrifice in that sense? Rosh Hashira today is a preeminent posik in, in Eretz Yisrael and around the world, a Rosh Hashiva, a Rav, a Hazur Kolal, and, and yet, and, and to achieve that level, to be such a world-class posik, Tamu Chacham, person has to certainly retreat and immerse themselves in Torah, and yet the Rosh Hashiva is obviously heavily invested in and is given time to Kirov. Are there sacrifices that Rosh Hashiva had to make in his own learning in order to also care about Chalai Israel? Of course, if I'd be learning day and night, it would be different. Uh, I, I, would, I would be a different person, there's no question. Um, I'm not so unhappy with the person I became, um, only because I, I really feel a sense of responsibility. Um, in terms of my own family, we had, when my kids were growing up, we had all kinds of guests. Um, and uh, I don't think it did any damage. If anything, uh, uh, I think it was very good for them. I think it was very, very healthy for them. It was very, very healthy for them. Um, uh, I would see, you know, I would see the different encounters that we had at the table. The kids were always listening like, so carefully. When do you get to discuss and you know with your kids? Hmm. Oh, well, you, you, your kids come back and you're going to talk in At what age do you talk in Muna? So you have somebody that's in your home asking questions, you're giving them intelligent answers, and your kids are listening. They're getting the chinuch that we can get out of They're also seeing it not from people that, you know, a, a, a kid growing up really feels like the street has so much to offer. What can you do in Orthodox? You know, I'm a mining, I'm Orthodox, I don't want to burn Gehenna's, I can't do all the good things that the world has to offer. You see someone sitting at the table that comes from that world that has everything to offer, and for some reason, he takes interest in what we are living. That means that there must be something special about and especially as people are becoming more and more from it does so much for the kids. They, they get to appreciate what we have. So, so to pivot from the churban of what's going on, as much as there's positive in the world that we focus on that and 
the Rosh Hashanah has a tremendous simchas hachayim. Clearly, he's a person who focuses on positivity, but that korban that is the the world is, is very um, disturbing away from Achrayes within our own Torah community. I, I can't speak for it to show, but in America, there's a struggle. You know, on the one hand, we have the issue of outreach; on the other hand, we have a challenge of retention. We have issue within our own community because the world is so much smaller and it's so much more available and it's so much more open and people are exploring and they're curious or they're turned off or they've been traumatized and, and they're, they're, taking, they're making other choices. The, what would the Rosh Hashiva say to parents who have a child who's choosing a different derech, who's off the derech, off their derech, off our derech? What, what kind of uh, approach should those parents take in terms of the other siblings in the family, in terms of giving that child space, nevertheless taking pride, showing love, or particularly if it's a young age, when you get a sense that it could be heading there, do you double down, do you become stricter, do you become more careful? How do we deal with that challenge? It's not an ideological question, it's a strategic one. Um, I haven't seen that uh, uh, clamping down on kids does anything other than make them run. Um, I remember there was a time in our neighborhood, it was a whole chabura of kids from the finest families, that were on their way out. Some were already in the holiday Shabbos and were smoking on Shabbos. They, they hung out together, but they were not. High. They dropped out of the yeshiva, down of them. Uh, it was pretty bad. And everybody went to get advice from whoever it is they turned to. This one went to the uh, people. This one went to a shach. And, and this one went to a child psychologist. This one went to a famous machana. Everybody went, and they all got the same exact answer. The shach put it, Ahavah lo tina'im unconditional love, period. Mm -hmm. Everybody did it. Every one of those kids is from. Wow. Every one of those kids is from. They all came back. Mm -hmm. So unconditional love for that child. Unconditional love. But how does the parent know, particularly when they're young, if the child has made that choice already? So recently somebody just asked me, in America it was, it will be on the holding Halloween. And, and they have a child who's struggling and challenged and has chosen the wrong group of friends and wanted to dress up and go around. And the parent is devastated. On the other hand, for that child, if the answer will be no to that, then this child will continue to slippery slope down. So there are practical strategic questions with each yes. time. Yeah, I was, uh, experience has shown that you work with them, not against them. Um, I'm afraid so many of the things that parents do not want to allow their kids to get away with, uh, it's, not, it's not so much a matter of they feel that this is harmful to the kid, but they find it embarrassing. In other words, I find that parents will allow kids to get away with a lot more as long as it's not outward, as long as no one else is going to know. You know, you can do what you want in the house, but don't really dress out to outdoors in a way that people realize you're strong. If, if what you're dealing with is the parents' own pride shame on them, there's no excuse for that. If, if your image in the community is more important than your kids, there's something wrong with you. And I don't blame your kids for the devil. <laughs> um, but if, if what you're talking about is really a feeling that the kid doesn't have, you know, he's just not connecting to, he's not connecting to his neshama, yeah, it's not even to get the connection. Work with him. Just, you can't just know, know, know everything, but you've got to make things, you got to make things exciting. And the overarching is, is unconditional love. Unconditional the, the foundation love. is love, and then on top of that. Yeah, unconditional love. Bechlal, chinuch starts before, before the kids start having their, their problems. The kids have been brought up in a happy home. The kids have been brought up in a home where, 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 where you love doing mitzvahs. Where everyone loves doing it since you grow up at home, where everyone's always catching and complaining about how difficult things are. So what do you expect them to get? That's the message you're hearing all the time. Right. And, and zooming out the last of Chinuch, in general, not just a child who's, who's challenged or struggling with the derech, but every child who davening is a challenge for everybody. So how much do you force, open the sitter, daven, did you daven? Are they in shul next to you and you keep pointing the sitter? Oh, or, no, the child's going to daven eventually if they see your model of davening. So give them space, and if they don't daven, that's their loss, that's their mistake, that's their growing pain. There's this famous, uh, this famous zog of the Chazanish, where they asked him, where, if you're davening in shul and your kid is next to you and he's daydreaming, should you keep reminding him to look into the sitter? And the Chazanish used to say, he said that if you daven, that's one thing. Your kid will see you down there. If you spend your dad pointing to him, 
So he, the way he put it was, Dol Shimusha Yosem Menehuda. Shimush is what they see in there. If they see you davening, they'll learn to daven. If they see you nunuing during davening, then they're going to learn to nunu during davening. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're teaching them that you're supposed to daven, that's limud. The Dol Shimusha, what they're going to get from the example is much stronger. Mm -hmm. Spend your davening davening. But, but your kids learn to daven from you. So even if, even at home, they're not getting out of bed. They're not opening that sitter. Their daughter is, let's say, they're not opening that sitter. Time goes on. You have to find a way to make davening exciting for them. First thing you do is that they should know what they're doing. Get them used to it. I, I, I always say the first thing you got to do is forget the rituals. Teach your kids to talk to Hashem. Get them used to talking to Hashem. Let them have their own conversation with them. You also have to teach them that there are no rules. Do a lot of screen. Do a lot of screenish. Where did I get that from? Ever we kill them? Do I know this stuff? We never have a good screen television. Who will us sit on the seashell? Yeah, get it? Kids have to know you tell the truth with Hashem. Share your feelings about him with him. Share your frustrations about life with him. Know that there's an interest. Then we can talk about dominating. But if you don't know that there's someone to talk to, if you never had the experience of talking to Hashem, so what's dominating anyway? A ritual? Why should you feel like that? You know, the Rosh Hashiva comes from more Hasidic background. So Rosh Hashiva feel that in the more Lifesh upbringing of the traditional Yeshiva, we don't talk enough about Hashem. We're so focused on like Gemara Rashi, Tosus, and Lamdus, and Halacha, you, one can make it. In America, particularly in a more day school uh, system, one can make it through an entire entire Jewish education, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and in the end, know a lot of information, but never have a relationship. Not even know that he's there, know, not feel that he loves you or you were supposed to love him. He never made it to the curriculum. He's just not there. I, 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 they're afraid to teach about it. I don't know. I don't get it. I went to the Lipkisha system. My mother, the Dafka, she rebelled against the family. She wanted me to have a Lipkisha education. She said she wanted me to be a, a Talmud Chacham, not a Tishko. That, that was the way she put it. Um, yeah, I had one Zayn who survived the Holocaust, and he was there, a good Chassidish year, and he was I remember. And, and he was screaming, okay, so be a Talmud Chacham, who's going to teach him to make an Ashley Well, that, those were the words he used. Who's going to teach him to make an Ashley so my answer was, uh, and I didn't know at the time, my mother did. <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely got my relationship with Hashem, I got it at home, I got it in the shtibu, we down and did. No question. Of course, once you got it, then, then, then you know whose Torah you're learning. So they have to go hand in hand. There has to be a return just, to an emphasis. Yes! Well, people are embarrassed to talk about Hashem. Right. I think many of the machans and, and, and I include myself among them, Ravana, Machanchem, they're struggling or comfortable in their, in their own right. So it's hard to teach something that you don't necessarily fully experience. So when you've been raised that way, it's a vocabulary you're unfamiliar with. Aish is willing to educate any Ravana that are interested. We are willing to share a Muna with Ravana, whether it's going to make, be a, a seminar, a retreat, whatever it is, we are open to give Rabbanim the tools, first of all, to build their own relationship with Hashem, but the tools to give it to others. Mm -hmm. It's definitely very needed, very needed. I know it was told to me by one of the Tamid in the Rashiva. Rashiva says that uh, if the Rashiva could add a 14th uh, Iker to the Rambam, it would be that Hashem loves us, that Hashem loves us. I once wrote an article about Hashem loves us, other religions took that from us, God loves you, we've got to bring that back. And I got a series of emails criticizing me. It's other religions, what do you talk, what does it say? How can you say such a thing? It's not true, the show does not feel it, it doesn't love us. What would the Rashid say to, to that? Because it's a whole group of people, not just young people, there are adults who grew up not feeling it, and who continue to feel it, especially now they're feeling patched by Hashem, whether it's financially, whether it's in relationships, whether it's failed dreams, whether it's struggles that they're having. They, they feel the opposite, Hashem doesn't love me. I can say Hashem loves me, look at my life, look at my struggles, look at my challenges. And maybe I feel, maybe I'm lo unlovable. I'm so far from him, I felt him so badly. How could he possibly love me? So what would the Rosh Hashiva say? How, how do we make people know and believe? Why should we feel that he loves us? <laughs> the last Navi. Right? Malachi starts off with that. that, that that's the last Navua. I mean, the last Navi that Kali Yisrael had. I guess in the later days we have, to, we have to know that one. We have to, Hashem loves everybody. 
Hashem created our struggles. Hashem created our weaknesses. He understands them better than we do. He's there rooting for us. He feels bad for us when we fail, and he's hoping we're going to get our act together. Hashem is there with everybody. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. How do we reconcile that he loves us, but he holds us accountable? Is there punishment? This punishment? The, greatest, the greatest, remember, Hashem created the world to give. Right? It was with Sonu Yisbarach Lahetiv. That was the purpose. And it was over the Marshaf, though, to create it only with me, this Hadid. What that means is that there's no greater giving than did, than accountability. There's no greater giving. The way you build a person is by giving him responsibility. Hashem is not holding us accountable because he's, he's this, this terror. He holds us accountable because there's nothing like earning your eternity. There's nothing like earning your stay. Anything else he'd give us would be second rate. So the greatest chesed is holding us accountable. He's doing it only out of love, nothing else, nothing, nothing else. And for a person who doesn't feel that love, a person who's struggling, a person who's going through a hard time, should they feel he's punishing them? I have a dear father going through a very hard time, a sick chop. Kirsch Borg is punishing. How can Hashem punish him? It's not over yet. It's not over yet. What if he does chuba? Hashem is not giving him a chance. In this world, the way we look at it in, in this world is that it's not about punishment. You know, ultimately, it's Dinah Hashem. But until that point, it's Hashem giving us messages, Hashem giving us opportunities. He's giving us challenges to bring out the best in us. And we have to get the message. We have to take the pain and feel the Sashem growing me. The Sashem getting it be greater. So what should have advice how to, how to practice that? Is his spoke to to talk to Hashem? What should have said to teaching children before you get to the sitter to talk to him outside of the sitter? Are there exercises in Amuna? What are the things that can help build a person to be stronger so that they intuitively react this way when challenges come? It begins with talking to Hashem, but it includes a lot of talking to oneself. You know, we, we're, we have to work through actually one second. Why is Hashem doing this to me? He loves me so much. Why does he want me to get out of this? The question is always, listen, Hashem is doing this for me. What does he want me to take from this? Why am I going to be a greater person once I'm done? With this? That's an internal conversation. It's an internal conversation. And by the way, when someone else is suffering, this is not what you hear. There's the dichotomy, the dichotomy that we have when it comes to Biron Machavero and Allah, Allah, the Bidrachos, we play Hashem. In Biron Machavero, we don't have the right to start giving people Musa when we're suffering. The first thing we've got to do is be there for people, which is not just empathy, but do whatever we can. We have to feel for them and enlist in their support whatever we can do to help them. If one is in a position where people are looking to you for guidance as well, after you do whatever you can, that's when you have to start talking to them about that how we should think of. So mostly it's talking to Hashem, talking to ourselves. Yeah. Putting ourselves in that position to feel His presence, to feel His yeah. love. Yeah. Is, is Isha Torah and the, the discovery for that summer? So I heard the, the Bible codes and the whole discovery seminar many, many times. So people's crisis of faith today, we're losing the opportunity to point to Holocaust survivors, which I myself, lived off of and encouraged other people too in our community and elsewhere, anyone who went through that and maintained the Muna Hashem, ride their coattails. Just 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 join on and, and, and take from there. Sakharov used to say write them a kvittle. <laughs> so so we, we have that, we're losing that opportunity today. And today, you know, somebody doesn't believe in God because their Wi Fi was slow. Someone doesn't believe in God for the most seemingly small, petty, and consequential. It's like, where is he? I don't believe in him anymore. When people who lost everything maintain their faith. So when someone's struggling with Amunah, what do we cut at them? We come at them with, with Bible codes. We come at them with wonders of Jewish history. Pro we proofs. come at them with evidence. Proof, proofs are proofs only reach a certain, a, a certain, a very, a very specific uh, uh, segment of the population. Um, I'll tell you, things have changed a lot. It's a very cold world out there. And what gets people more than anything else is our chesed, our love. Nobody does chesed like from Jews. And they face it. There, there's nothing like it anywhere else out there. The, the way we just give of ourselves to others, the way we, we sincerely care about others, it doesn't exist anywhere else. The very first thing that you care about, they met someone who really cares. 
That, that, that's the beginning. There's also a lot of the warmth in Yiddish that has to be sold with them. It has to be, has to be shared with them. Um, a lot of emotional stuff. Although Yiddish Kai essentially is not emotional, Yiddish Kai is essentially so we go to a targeting at Gorm. Um, today, if you don't directly oppress the Neshama, then you're ignoring the nefesh of the highway of the person. Uh, the psyche of most people today is really hurting. It's either numb or hurting. And you have to reach that first. And then you can start raising it. Only then can you start raising it. You know, that's why Shabbaton are so effective. Uh, some of the most effective speakers are the ones that get people crying. Uh, and, and, you know, if that's where people are at, then we gotta know it, we gotta live it. You know, we gotta, we, we gotta make use of that. The experiential today is much more strong. So basically, be like God before you talk about God. Let the person experience and tell them what came to yeah. you, and then you can come and talk about you it. You say it right like yeah. yeah. I always understood that was God no Achmasasar from the Kabbalah's Pnei Shrim. If you could choose between being like God, or even talking to God, yeah. you can bring him into this world by being like him. Yeah. So we need more of that, yeah. of being like him. Yeah. I, I noticed even throughout this conversation, I hope it's okay, it's not close to Dick, but no more on the Shrim. The Rashi has a smile, always. Whatever we're talking about, even Chorban, and even the challenges of Chinuch, and the challenges, the simplest Chaim, this smile, this positivity, is that something that Rosh Hashiva feels naturally worked on? Is this an ongoing effort? Does it, does it come easily to feel the, happy and smile? The way I am, her life is beautiful. Life is beautiful. Challenges, challenges are exciting. I'm not looking for them. <laughs> I'm looking they're exciting. People are fascinating. I'm also in a, in a, in a, you know, in a place where people are just thirsty for the Baruch which is so, so beautiful. But I grew up in a happy home, all survivors. I grew up in a happy home. And uh, there were lots of things that had to be worked on. Um, yes, I was the children of survivors, and there was lots of, there was lots of anxiety, and they were afraid, always afraid for me. And uh, of course, we picked that up at home. There were a lot of things that had to be worked through. But the basic simplest thing, I definitely got it. Definitely. Um, I share this one story that I share with people all the time. It's the most profound, the most profound thing I ever heard from my father is from um, the My parents were survivors. Yeah. My mother was in Auschwitz. Um, her father survived by going to, to the States just before we were trying to get the family out. He wasn't able to. Um, she lost her, her, her brothers and her sister and mother. Um, she survived Auschwitz. My, uh, my father ran. His whole family went to Auschwitz, and it seems like they went past Auschwitz to other places too. And my father was just running. He ran, he found himself in an unoccupied part of Romania. Um, he survived the war, came back, and there was no one. He was the youngest of seven children. Five of them were married with children. He had nieces, nephews. Had parents, he had his grandfather who, who, who was an other god. It was a it was a hush of a family, a warm family, a big family. Nobody came. Nobody came alone in the world. So he found himself after the war in the home of the closest relative, which was the father of his uh, the father of his sister's husband, father of his brother. Uh, and his sister did not come back either. Um, well, that person happened to have been my mother's uncle. So they had two Hasidish kids. My father was just alone in the world, lost. So my mother approached him and said, let's get married, I'll take care of you. And that's what happened. And uh, I had a beautiful marriage. They were really just a couple, they were so different. They had a beautiful marriage, and my mother was everything there. She passed away when they were both 90. At the end of the Shiva, he turns to me and he says, you know, if I really wanted to, I could be miserable. I was so powerful. If I really want to, I can be miserable. 
Well, he didn't want to. He was never 8 years. He lived to 98. He had heart trouble. His lungs weren't working so well. His digestion stopped working. Ultimately, he couldn't walk. His kidneys weren't doing so well. He lost his hearing. He barely saw. He was so happy. He was just so happy. People loved coming to him because he was so happy. He would just elevate everybody. If you really want to, you can be miserable. If that's what you want to be, not for you. <laughs> His default was to be happy. He could have, he could have forced himself to be miserable. You want you, I, I don't know, was it, to understand happiness is a choice. You can, you can experience it. You know, you know how it's this, every, there's no such thing. Everything is free will. Everything is a matter of a matter of how you choose. The Torah can be machayev us to be happy. The Torah can, can require us to love Hashem. The Torah can require us years shemai. These are all emotions. How can, how can we be machayev and emotion? Yes! You choose how to feel. It's up to you. So if you want to be miserable, good for you. You just want to be miserable. If that's what you want. If you choose to be happy, be happy. Be happy. And, that, and that's really the secret. You can choose to be happy. Does Rosh Hashanah ever get down? Unhappy? Have to turn it around to, to, to remember it. It's, it's much more. It's much more. There are times that I'm just so overtired that it's difficult not to be depressed, and you got to work on it. You know, when 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 you got to push yourself to be able to to do anything. You know, there are times you bar hush, bar hush. There's a lot of things, but there are time consuming. There are time consuming, and there's not that much time to sleep. And there are times that that, 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 that one is just so drained. Add to that. You mentioned, you know, you get stories, you deal with people, you deal with people, uh, all kinds of situations. And there are times that it gets you down, and you have to work. You really have to work. You know, it's not just natural. It's, uh, you can't just play dumb and smile. You, know, you really have to work through things and push yourself. It's not easy, but again, it's choice. Do you want to be miserable? Do you want to be depressed? It's part of the conversation we have with ourselves. I, I spoke on Shabbat Shuvah this past year. The Quran and everybody else who talks about the Maharal, we focus on the Makam and the Chavero, we neglect the Nadam Ma'atzma. But if you don't have a healthy Nadam Ma'atzma, if you don't have a healthy relationship with yourself, how can you have a healthy relationship with others? And, and I found a study, we say, according to most, four million words a day to ourselves. The conversations in our own head is close to four million words a day we're saying with those conversations. But we're not aware, we're not controlling or regulating them, or we're not, the Shiva has not said several times about the importance of what we tell ourselves, what we say to ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves, how we get ourselves right. How, how do we nurture that relationship in other Ma'atma? First of all, we can't get credit for ourselves. People are afraid of accepting themselves, of respecting themselves, because I'm going to be guy to that. One second, Hashem made us. Whatever skills we have are God given. We, we, we didn't make it. Even if we had to work on developing them, Hashem gave us the energy to do that. There's very little we can really take credit for. Very, very little. The fact that Hashem gives us credit for all of our needs, this is all a chis. It's, it's, it's all a chis. Hashem a chis. It's a chis that He pays us for our needs. So we accept that Hashem did something really wonderful. Hashem gave you you. Appreciate you. Appreciate your strengths. If, if, if you're afraid of accepting your strengths, how are you ever going to get in? You can't deny your weaknesses, but you got to accept your strengths and use them. And be appreciative and be happy that you've got that. Rosh Hashiva mentioned, Rosh Hashiva's mother said to Rosh Hashiva's father, let's get married and I'll take care of you. And really maybe on paper they wouldn't have matched. And if they were born in a different time and a different place, and they had to submit resumes with a picture, without a picture, and Shabbat Shalom were involved. They may never have, they never they would, the shit up. They would never have met. So, so, there are challenges with the shit up system today. Again, I can speak for America, not the situation here in Israel. It seems like we've compounded problems instead of taking them away. We're adding layers and layers and obstacles and obstacles with these uh, inquiries and inquisitions and, and the level of questions that are asked and, and pictures that are demanded. And we're not simplifying it, we're making it more complicated. And the evidence is that we're not having more success, we're having more struggles. What can be done to improve the shadow system? It has nothing to do with the shadow system, it has to do with the maturity of the people in the system. We have. I, I, I love the shadow system. That, I, I grew up there, that's my life. 
it's the no place on earth I feel more comfortable than on the hard benches of the base measures. But face it, it's a nice, cozy place where you never have to grow up. We don't want responsibility. We don't want responsibility for ourselves. We don't want responsibility for others. We don't, we don't understand relationships. It's very easy to develop a relationship with people that are like-minded. It's so good that you can all get together, it's like summer camp forever, all have a great time knocking everybody else. You know, we're sheep of guys, we're critical, we're cynical, we're, 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 uh, we can be mavatal, everything. Because we're all, we all think the same. We all, we're all subscribed to the same stuff. Really learning, learning to build a relationship with another human being is part of growing up. And we're not given such opportunities. In fact, most yeshiva guys who are busy dorming, the years that they're so impressionable in terms of relationships, they're not even at home. They don't get to see home. They don't get to see what home is supposed to be. So it is unfortunate that I I don't know what expectations are matters. You know, people don't really know what is that. Shana Bachar, when he's about to start dating a girl back in seminary, should we be doing more to prepare them, expose them, train them on those qualities and skills so they're more ready to go into the we marriage? Should definitely, you should definitely train them. It does not do the shame should do them. These are, these are tools we have to give them for life. Mm -hmm. Responsibility. There are plenty of things that people can do to that Bachar learn to take responsibility for in Yeshiva. We don't have to say that. There are plenty of things that can learn to take responsibility, among other things they're learning. You know, like giving tests in Yeshiva, once you're in a serious Yeshiva test, ah, it's found them. Why not make them take responsibility for their learning? The idea that they have to take responsibility for everything they have to know, not just the Yeshiva curriculum. Making their own stuff. And if the yeshiva doesn't have a serious halacha saver, then they don't have to know halacha. Hopefully you'll marry someone who can have a good halacha ready in the seminary. Uh, just, just as examples. You know, you don't have to know Navi, you don't have to touch so what do we believe? You don't have to know all that. Taking responsibility for oneself. And the other ones in terms of relationships, they don't know how they're own. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate. I, I, I was in the near the last years of the French who lived as a hundred and he drew Beit Adam Machavero into us. Anyone who was in the yeshiva in the years of Rukhaya, anyone understands what it means to care for another human being. And understands that what marriage is about is caring. And learning to develop um, a shared life where you're there for one another. Everyone understands. It, it, it was just it was so deeply ingrained in us. Shoes after shoes after shoes. That's what every parasha taught. That's what every parasha taught. And it was your passion letters. Nothing was without a source. You know, you call it Tarakula. Literally by heart from Bader. Had, had him a car or two or three for everything he said. You know, yeshivas have to, have to, they have to instill a real bit of a and a mature bit of a mature one, not a. Not a stilted one, not this artificial, you know, dealing with donkey dakos when the basic ideas of that are not, not getting across. It has to be done well. I think it, I mean, they've got their, their work cut out for them. Uh, there's, there's really a lot to do. What happened in the olden days? I don't know. I don't know. It seems like uh, most people did all right without being pretty. I don't know. It could be that life was just so tough, and besides, most kids went to work when they were in the teens already, even if they were learning. Right. You know, could be... They had to find a place to sleep and a home to have to eat, and there was a yeah, price built into the system. There was a there, yeah. And the other thing is that, you know, Baruch, Baruch Hashem, we spoke Latin, and that's where we're so delicate. You know, today the worst thing you can do is hit a kid. Hit a kid, ah, oh, you can be sure he's going to be off of I don't know, I'll speak for myself. Who didn't grow up being hit? <laughs> where everybody hit, parents and teachers and everybody hit. Our favorite teachers hit us. Everybody hit. So there's room today still for a patch? Nah. Not Are you anymore. kidding? Not Are you anymore. kidding? If your kid doesn't, doesn't, doesn't get you in prison, I'm <laughs> Right. But in the old days, it was, it was a more effective. Like, we're all just, everyone's spoiled. Everyone's spoiled. You know, there, there's this, 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 this feeling of entitlement. And then there's no question why things don't work. So there's a lot, really a lot that, that kids do have to work. So it's much more fundamental than the system. Much more fundamental. Yeah, as far as I don't, you know, I, I know every, the system is everyone's punching back. Uh, I am not going to add my, my name to I, I, I just, I love the Yeshiva world. I, I, I mean, that's, that's our life. 
that's our life. Um, there are things that we have to we have to improve on. In a big way, there are things we have to improve on, and, and, I, and I think we have to take it seriously and not be afraid. Not be afraid of doing things a little differently. Our Masora, what a yeshiva looks like, uh, you can't tell me that it's from Europe because our yeshivas don't look like what they look like in Europe. Uh, how, many, how many generations is older? Really? We have to adapt to the new mm -hmm. to the new situation. Is that part of what motivated the Rosh Hashim of Jerusalem Kolo, which has a different focus on Kira? Someone described to me as a graduate school for outreach. It's really preparing people to beyond just the learning the here and now, to an eye to a future and to have a vision and to feel an achrayas and training. It's something unusual I understand about that call, different than most call them, is that the wives are involved, the Edmonds are involved, because they'll be part of that team that go out and do Kirif too. And by, by the way, it, it's not a Kirif training program. It's preparing people for, for service to Kalal Yisrael, mostly by pe preparing, prepare, by, by building themselves and whom they are, their relationship with Hashem, their relationship with learning, they're becoming responsible, they're, they're, they're better than Machavir. We invest very much in all of those things. There's some gear training too, mm -hmm. which is hands on experience. Mm -hmm. but, but for the most part, it's, it's getting them ready for, for, for being out there in the world of outreach, of sharing, of sharing the beauty of Torah with people. And that's why the wives are included. Of course. Of course. They're a critical part too. Not too. <laughs> Not too. I mean, in, in, in many cases, they make the difference. And the Rosh has been so generous with his time. I have maybe one or two more questions. Uh, the Rosh has emerged to be a, a really a preeminent posik for in Eretz Yisrael, the Anglo community, and well, well, first of all, first of all, yes, I, I deal I deal with a lot of stuff, but I think a lot of it is because I've I've dealt with and gotten into and invested in areas that no one else really has. Uh, there there are a lot of really good people around. Uh, I'm, I'm not there. In terms of areas like, like in, in, in terms of the shyness that come up, the contemporary shyness and cure as such, you know, I invested heavily in that. I, you know, I, I, I love learning, but a lot of it has been way inflated. I know my place. <laughs> we appreciate the Roshina's modesty, but I know that no, 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 people have shyness from all over about everything. Okay, yeah. So I want uh, to know. Where the Rashiva got Shima Shimsak, who the Rashiva's mentors, so to say, in, in answering Shaivas, and what are some of the most, maybe that people don't appreciate from a post sake side of the desk perspective, what are some of the most important principles or rules or what the Rashiva's thinking about in approaching Psaq? Yeah, so as far as, far as Psaq al I, I, I did, Baruch Hashem, I was in Yushalayim and had exposure to, and, and exposure to some very early people. First of all, the first was a family connection, the Mincha Sitzchak, who was in the, the, the then the 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 Rolling of Ada Kravis and definitely a world renowned Pulsi. Um, because of family, there was a Kufa Aker in Shabbos and, and Gala, even though his Dara Halim was totally different. But in terms of in terms of understanding what you're allowed to do in Psaq and what you're not allowed to do in Psaq, he taught me many things and he was very strong. Uh, I remember one time he was present, it was a family Simcha. And I, I, uh, I gave a drosh in, in, on a certain sugya and came up with a halucha And he smiled and said, la halucha <laughs> wow. You know, he, he let me know that I was that, that was going a little, a little too far. So that, you know, that definitely. But I spent I spent a lot of time running to Rabbi Yerushif. In my days, he was much more accessible. Um, uh, there are many areas in halacha. I, I managed to discuss with him. There was a tkufa I was giving a halacha chabur in the mirror, and I generally discussed the sugi with him the day I gave the chabur. Mm -hmm. So the first thing was, it was always a bit of a, I just spent two weeks preparing the sugi. Um, I was really in it, and uh, like really, I should have had it on his fingertips. <laughs> if I had any, you know, if I thought I discovered something new, I thought I discovered it's always been there. And of course, you know, of course, better than I did. Um, but I got, I got a lot from that. I also used to speak to the soya fisher, um, uh, who was also was a, was a big goal. Um, once I came to Aish, so we had a lot of sensitive shyness. Uh, there were some shyness that I went to Rebbe with, but he was already more difficult to get into. The, the culture of shy lads had changed and uh, he was not so available anymore. Um, I, I developed a relationship with Shomzana. 
Mm. Um, Rashon Zalman understood not only people, but cultures. Uh, what I, I learned from Rashon Zalman, I would say that the Sanhedrin, at least somebody there, had to understand Shivin Lashon, they had to understand every language, because you couldn't have an interpreter in the Sanhedrin. I understood it's not just a matter of language. I assume it's all the different dialects, too. And it's the subtleties. Because when you have a dictator, you got to really hear what to say. Which means you really have to understand every culture. What kind of human being gets it? Rashon Zalman. He had an understanding of people and cultures and backgrounds. He would, he would catch it in the um, Rebbe Yashiv, it's interesting, though. People made Rebbe Yashiv was totally, he was totally outside. He just, he just knew the safe, he was outside of, of, of real life. So first of all, you have to remember, he sat on the Bezna bubble for like 50 years. He had all the, all the crazy, the crazy family shyness that, that, you know, that, that, that happened in secular Israel that came there also. Uh, he, he, he knew the world. He knew the world. Uh, his thing was not to show any world leaders. You had to supply him with all the background information. But once you did, he got it. And, you know, everyone knows Rabbi Ash is this big macher. He also knew the coolest that nobody else knew. If you needed a Das Yochid to rely on the Shah Satchar, he knew the Das Yochid that no one else knew. Mm. This is before he goes to a Chokhmer. Right. Um, but what I got out of them is the COVID rush that every Shire deserves. Nothing was killed. Everything was with cold and crush, everything was with seriousness. It didn't make a difference if, if it was a, whether we were dealing with a shadow or a whether or not someone may marry, um, a question of a, a medical shadow or a shadow on this conscious. Everything, everything, everything. Um, there's a particular sock we got from Shom Zalman that, uh, that it, it sits with me. Uh, um, we had a, we had a, uh, we had a student, we had a student here at H, we married him, he was raised, he was family, he was traditional, he was sort of. Their standards of conscience were not, uh, not especially great. Um, but then Shemitah came, it was a real issue. Because they were just hacking here across the board, um, which in Yeshiva's here, you're taught not to rely on. Rebel Yashin had said then that there was a Supreme Court ruling that the sale of the land was not serious, it was a religious formality. Um, Rabbi Yasha said you couldn't rely on it under any circumstances. So basically, would mean not eating it is in most place. So we decided we'll take him to Rabbi Yasha, to excuse me, to Rishwam Zalman, and I'll see what he says. Rishwam Zalman listens to this to me and says, listen, Shemitah Bismana says in the Rabbi. Machlok is in the family involves so many Yisur and Dorais. Eat head to Mechiru, just don't make a Machlok. <laughs> Every case has to be reviewed. But understand, Machlok is is deadly. It's also going to arise without question. I mean, that's not the easy answer to things that are not comfortable, you know, where it does, that don't live up to your, 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 your level of religion. Wow. So that's the Cheshvan of a post It's not just it's every point of soccer, the halacha, it's the people who are in front of you. It's the bigger picture and the implications of it, and all that goes into a particular stock. Yeah. 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 So that, I mean, it, it was very enlightening. I was being able to spend time, to spend time with, with you know, really, really big people and understanding, understanding how they process the show. It's, 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 not, it's not just technical. You know, no one sheet is invite, but I didn't get an answer. It's only a tangible one for it. Um, which is a challenge in our generation, too. The people who think you can Google everything. Oh, sure. The Korean the Korean Korean the Korean Korean. The Korean. Yeah, I was like, I hope. So, so the last question, again, so grateful to the Shiva for his time. We're sitting here in the Ish building, the Ish Shiva, Ish Complex, World Headquarters, all that's going on. It's extraordinary. I'm, I'm blown away. I'm honored to, to be able to participate in such a small way with it. What's, what's the vision? How can Ish make that difference and that impact? I know with technology, with the website, there's a vision, a dream to hit a certain number of millions of people. Are there boundaries um, for the purpose of Kirov? 
Is there concern we're using technology or using even pop culture references in articles to be able to reach people who otherwise would have no connection? Where are those boundaries of, of being oh, It's so people? difficult. It is so difficult. We have regular meetings dealing with that alone. I have a regular meeting, I have a regular meeting with, with, the, with the senior management um, dealing with where we draw the line, where we don't draw the line. What is acceptable, what is not acceptable. You know, H.com, we've announced very clearly, is no longer targeting film people. Um, film people may feel uncomfortable with some of the articles on it. Uh, there's lots of Tory you can read, you don't have to go to H.com. Um, we're trying to target people that, that are really not affiliated, and because of that, we're, we're doing things we didn't do before. But it's so delicate. Not everything's meant to be the name of Kirov, but not everything's also in the name of Kirov. And you gotta understand that there's no way of being safe. Like, just be macro will be okay. Just be macro real. There, there's no way. You can't, you, you've gotta reach Jews in the most effective way possible. We're trying to reach the unreachable. We, we've set a number of three million. We believe that that's a critical mass of Jews that's gonna know that there's a creator and that he left us his instructions for, for the most meaningful and enjoyable way to live. And that being a Jew means studying divine wisdom. That's what we want to do. The only way we're going to get there is if we, we, we have some very provocative and outrageous stuff out there that's going to get those people interested. Now, not everything is muttered. Not everything is muttered. Articles are, are reviewed over. I'll tell you, you know, often I'm asked to review an article that's about to be posted, and my filter will not allow me to see it. And I don't just mean the graphics, I mean the content as well. So, you know, everything, everything has to be reviewed carefully. Our staff itself is very sensitive by now. They know when to ask the Shiloh. They know when something really has to be discussed. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of the sense of things they develop, I mean, we have yeshiva, we have, we have yeshiva people here that, that, that are truly Reish and I and, and, uh, and understand. Um, and then uh, a lot we learn by experience, you know, as well. Uh, we do have the issue always of even if Hashem holds his right, will Fun Jewry forgive us? And, and, and there, you know, there are times that we, we, we have to do some damage control. In order to reach Jews, we're going to have to do things that we're going to get a lot, a lot of flack for. But it's got to be within reason. We are insiders. We are not Michal Salah. We are Yeshiva right. We're doing things that are creative and different because we have to we have to reach the people out there. But we are yeshiva right. We're not rebels. Um, we're not uh, we're not uh, a new brand of orthodoxy. We're yeshiva right all the way. Um, we just have to be very creative in the way we reach people. And she's doing amazing work. I, I know many people who have from background and still find for the reasons we spoke of earlier because they go to other resources and it doesn't address most basic things that they want to feel and know and believe and derive inspiration from. So we're so grateful to the yeshiva, to Aish, and most of all to the Rosh Yeshiva for the time, the wisdom, for all the Rosh Yeshiva does. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's so nice spending some time together. That's been wonderful. Thank you. Okay, this was tremendous. This was... I, I went a little bit over time. I, I apologize. I took a lot of Rosh Yeshiva's we'll time. We'll but see. I, I, I think the message is now for the world to hear were unbelievable. Unbelievable, and everything here from Chenach were tremendous. I'm so grateful, so so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we have to work together. I mean, you have a lot. You have a lot to offer. You have a lot to offer. I understand. You have a lot of responsibilities too. I'm here to tell. I know Steve Berg is an old friend of mine. I tell him. I yeah. love the idea of convening a cabinet that will come to you, shall I? He keeps, offer, out there in the he keeps offering your services. I haven't seen it happen enough yet. Yeah. Listen, you know, we're, we're, tr we're trying to reach people. We have, we have the content. The lost content is the greatest. The presentation is outdated. The presentation is outdated, right? Um, we haven't yet really cracked like, how you present authentic ideas in a way that people in this day and age are really going to listen and say, yeah, I know that. You know, that's right. We haven't done it yet. We have a lot of experience here, articulate. Uh, we, we need your input. I'm, I'm there. I'm in. Whatever I can do. Whatever I can do. The opportunity to partner would be a great success.
I, I, I'm, I'm trying to put together a thing here of, of people, a real successful mashpian in, in reaching people out there. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I see you as a prime candidate for, for, for being out there. I appreciate it. I hope it's true, but I'm, I'm here and eager, eager to see Okay. So I hope we'll continue the conversation from here. All right. It's really a great space to spend time. Thank you so much. That was really an incredible uh, interview, a great, incredible conversation. There's so much to unpack, so much to think about, so much to implement in our own lives. The call, the responsibility for all of us to be involved in outreach. Every one of us can open our Shabbos tables. I think what's refreshing about Rav Berkowitz is as, as brilliant as he is, as much as he knows, as level-headed, as moderate uh, he is, his understanding of the world around us. And that goal of reaching 3 million Jews is just really a, a mind-boggling goal. And, and if we all partner and collaborate, we can achieve it. And the importance of avoiding machlokas, biblical prohibition of tension within a family, superseding others, the mind of a, of a posek who's able to, to balance those. And chinach, unconditional love, even when our children are not continuing exactly at that moment on our path. So much to think about, so much to take away. I hope you'll continue the conversation on your own. Until next time, stay